tonight, I have the great, great pleasure of uh, introducing to you Ed Berenson, uh, a person I met not too long ago, and we became very, very, very good friends. Like, we had, all, we had known each other all our lives. Uh, you know, he has a very distinguished academic past, and he's a very interesting human being as well. But the official biography goes something like this. Uh, Ed, Ed, Edward Berenson is a professor of history at NYU, which is New York University in the state of New York in Manhattan. He's also senior fellow at the National September 11 Memorial Museum. Uh, Berenson is a cultural historian specializing in the history of modern France and its empire, with additional interest in the history of Britain, the British Empire, and the United States. He's the author or editor of seven books, including Europe in the Modern World, just published last year by Oxford University Press. And he is currently working on a book entitled Blood Libel in an American Town, Messina, New York, 1928, which examines the lone case of a ritual murder accusation against American Jews. In 1999, Berenson received the American Historical Association's Eugene Asher Distinguished Teaching Award, having earlier won UCLA's, he used to teach at the University of California in Los Angeles, this is Distinguished Teaching Award. In 2006, uh, French President Jacques Chirac decorated him as a knight in the Order of Merit. So I am delighted to welcome him to the podium, and please wel help me in welcoming him as well. Ed. Thank you, Anwar. It's really great getting up to the stage and not having to walk upstairs. You know, no, no chance of, of an embarrassment. Is, is this the, this is the remote for the, I just want to make sure I, this is working. Okay. So, it's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, no, it's not working. I just, I just turned the switch on. All right, well, I can just, I'll just do it manually. There we go. Okay. Does that work? Oh, okay. I was just hitting the wrong, but I'm hitting the wrong thing. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about that. You, you can see that technology is not my, not, not my forte. I want to thank Anwar for in inviting me to, to Tangier, to giving this, this lecture. I've, I've been here since early in the week, and I'm having a blast, and I'm trying to convince Anwar into letting me come back as often as possible. So I'm really eager to, to talk to you about this, this subject. It's a difficult subject. It's often a, a controversial subject. And what I'm going to try to do is to briefly, in the time that I have, traced some of the highlights of the history of immigration in the United States. The United States of America is a nation of immigrants. If anybody knows anything about the United States, that's one of the things that, that you know. But what does it mean that the United States is a nation of, of immigrants? It's a complicated question, and I'm going to try to get into it. But one thing that's clear is that without the massive influx of people from Europe Africa, Asia, and Latin America, without the massive influx of people from all these places into the United States, the country would be completely different, much more sparsely populated than it is today, and very likely much less developed economically and socially. The United States owes its great economic strength to the immigrants who cultivated its lands, worked in its factories, built its infrastructure, and managed its economic, political, and cultural life. There were, of course, people already living in what began, became the United States before immigrants arrived. These were the Native Americans or American Indians. Nobody knows how many there were. But we do know that a great many American Indians succumbed to diseases unwittingly brought over from, from, from Europe and against which the native population had no defenses, no biological immunities. And, and we know that unfortunately there were a series of wars in the 19th century that ended up in the deaths of many, many, many American Indians. But had 
the Native American population been protected from, from immigration, they would have multiplied. They would have, they would have peopled the continent, but from a very small base. So that historians estimate that without the immigration that began in a really big way in the mid-19th century, the population of the United States today would be about half, about half of the 330 million people it is today. So since the founding of the American Republic in 1789, there have been three large waves of immigration. The first one, 1840 to 1860, mostly included people originally from Germany and Ireland. The second wave took place from 1890 to the end of the First World War, and in this second wave, a much larger wave, most of the people came from Southern and Eastern Europe. And then in the third wave, much more recently, between 1965 and 2008, 1965 saw the passage of a major piece of immigration legislation under the Lyndon Johnson administration. In this period, 65 to 2008, the United States opened its borders to Asians who had been largely excluded since the 1880s and to large numbers of people from Mexico and Central America. Ever since this first big wave of immigration in the middle of the 19th century, the phenomenon has been immensely controversial. But it has, it's divided Americans in unexpected ways. It has not divided Americans along classic right-left lines. And so that social conservatives, fearful that America was changing beyond recognition, became the de facto allies of left-wing labor union leaders who were concerned that a flood of immigrants would dilute the labor force and push wages down. So you had a left-right alliance. And meanwhile, businessmen who were generally conservative in their political views allied with left-wing idealists as both groups advocated relatively open immigration. The businessmen did so in an effort to recruit low-wage low labor, while the idealists on the left argued that everyone should have the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of American life. In these debates, the question of what it means to be an American played a major intellectual and philosophical role. Was American identity grounded in race, religion, and ethnicity as traditionalists and opponents of immigration tended to, to argue? That is, were real Americans, white, Protestant, and originally from England, Scotland, and Northern Europe? Or was American identity open to people of all races, creeds, and ethnicities? And was Americanness a function not of race, religion, and ethnicity, but of a commitment to American values and institutions, to a constitution and a set of political beliefs that enshrine in citizens the right to rule themselves. Through very, very much of these waves of immigration, the population was divided along these lines. And we have testimony from, from prominent Americans who took that first position that a real American was a Protestant from Northern Europe. Here's President Theodore Roosevelt, who argued against open immigration in the early years of the 20th century. And he said, and I'm quoting him, that by admitting, these are his words, Slavonic, Latin, Italian, and Jewish races to the United States, the country's leaders were committing race suicide, as the president put it. Now, Roosevelt later modified his views somewhat to say that it would be okay to admit a small number of non-Northern Europeans because, Roosevelt said, their supposed primitiveness would, would inject a dose of vitality into the American population. But Roosevelt emphasized when he became a little more open to immigration that the numbers of people who were different from the original white Protestants from Northern Europe, those numbers had to be small. The automaker, Henry Ford, I'm, the automaker, Henry Ford, 
I don't really need the remote since I'm standing here behind the, the podium. He had a similar view. He believed that the United States could absorb a small number of immigrants, but they would have to melt into the general population. And here you see the Henry Ford actually, among some of the, the people who worked for him, he had a ceremony in which he built a big melting pot. And so what you have here is that you have men, and they were always men, they were dressed in their, their garb from their original countries. And so they climb up the stairs, they get into the pot, and they come out all dressed the way a real American should look, waving American flags. And so this is Henry Ford's melting pot. And he said that it would be OK to have a small number of people who were unlike the original European population of the United States, but they would have to be a small number and that they would have to melt in to that general population. Now, going back to the beginning, the original legislation on immigration was enacted right at the beginning in 1790, and it had opened the borders of the United States to any white person who wanted to live in the new United States and conform to its laws. So anybody could emigrate to the United States as long as they were white. But the legislation didn't define whiteness. And ever since 1790, there have been intense arguments over who counted as white. Did Chinese and Japanese people count? And what about darker-skinned Mediterranean people? Italians, Greeks, Turks, and Arabs. Did they count as white? Well, for the first century or so of the American Republic, Chinese people counted. They were allowed to emigrate to the United States. But in 1882, a law excluded Chinese people from that point on. They were redefined as non-white and so therefore incapable of moving to the United States and assimilating to the American society. Chinese people were not, their exclusion of Chinese people to be the American citizens wasn't lifted until after the middle of the 20th century. But meanwhile, Mediterranean people, as well as Jews, were generally admitted to the United States as white. Although once they settled in that country, they found themselves, often found themselves, the, the objects of terrible discrimination and treated almost as if they were black. Now, as for African Americans, they were emancipated, as you know, from slavery in, 17, in 1863, and the adult men among the formerly enslaved were given citizenship in the constitutional amendments enacted after the Civil War. But in the South, Jim Crow laws made African Americans second-class citizens at best, and black Americans fared only slightly better in the North. Now, let's go back to the, the original European settlers of North, of North America and what would become the United States. Mostly, they, those who came voluntarily as opposed to the ones who came in the chains of slavery, most of the earliest European immigrants hailed from the British Isles, German-speaking Europe, and Scandinavia. They were overwhelmingly Protestant, and even though the different domination, denominations of Protestantism at first were in conflict with, in conflict with one another, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, Quakers, etc., originally hostile to one another, by the time of the American Revolution, much of that hostility had subsided. Included, in, included among these Protestant immigrants was a tiny number of Jews who settled sparsely in different cities along the Atlantic coast. During the first century or so of American history, Jews enjoyed perhaps an unprecedented degree of security and well-being, a security and, and well-being that, that the, the Jews of the diaspora had never experienced before. Their numbers in the United States were minuscule, and given the vastness of the country, most Americans didn't notice them. In 1776, the United States had 1,000 Jews representing less than one-tenth of one percent of the population. In 1840, there were just 15,000 Jews in the entire country, and in 1880, just as the 
first the wave of massive Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe and Russia was getting underway, the United States still in 1880 counted only 250,000 Jews or still only one half of 1%. Now, it was crucial for the Jews that the United States Constitution invested ultimate authority not in God, but in we the people. And it was crucial that the First Amendment provided that, quoting the First Amendment, Congress shall make no laws representing an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, this amendment, of course, didn't resolve all of the questions about the relationship between church and state, but what it did do, and this is extraordinarily important, is that it prevented one religion from being the dominant one. It prevented one religion from being the official one as the Church of England was in Great Britain. And so officially, according to the Constitution, Judaism enjoyed equal standing to all the other religions. And even more important than that, because there were so many different Protestant denominations, the Jews were just like one of those other denominations. They were a, a religious group like so many of the other ones, and that produced a level of tolerance, at least early on, that Jews had mostly experienced no place else. Now, Catholics, they experienced no such tolerance. When millions of Irish men and women fled the terrible potato famine of the 1840s, the potato famine, you'll remember, was a massive crop failure that that produced starvation in Ireland. The, the potato that was the staple of the, of, of the diet, it, it, it got a parasite and the potatoes were, were reduced to an inedible mush. There was nothing for people to eat. And at least a million and maybe more Irish people died and another million or so left the country and they came to the United States where they often found themselves denounced for their Catholicism. And they were even said, and it's really kind of extraordinary to read what was being said about, about Irish people in the 1840s and, and 1850s. They were said to be white only on the inside, uh, only on the outside, and on the inside they were black, which in the context of the middle of the 19th century in the United States made them inferior beings. So, did their Catholic religion. A religion that was seen as binding them to an autocratic pope and therefore making them unfit to live in a free country. This was an argument that would be made about Catholics in the United States for almost a century. That their allegiance to the pope, their being dominated by the pope, meant that they wouldn't be able, because of their religion, to be able to adapt themselves to living in a free country. But despite this hostility to Irish men and women, despite the prejudice against them, despite the worries about their Catholic, Catholic religion, nobody prevented them from coming in. There was no thought to exclude the Irish population pouring into the United States in the middle of the, in the 19th century. And so suddenly, the United States had a Catholic population of considerable size, and that Catholic population vastly exceeded the number of the other minority group that is Jews. And so, even though in the face of prejudice, in the face of hostility, and in the face of worries about an alien religion, especially Catholicism, there was no thought to exclude anybody who could be deemed to be white from coming in, and that included Chinese people up until 1882 with the passage of a piece of legislation known as the Chinese Exclusion Act that limited the, the, that prevented Chinese people from moving into the United States. And here it's, you can't see it, but this is a, a copy of the congressional legislation that barred the entry of Chinese people and you see Cartoons like this one with Uncle Sam giving the boot to a stereotypical Chinese looking, looking person. And so in 1882, Chinese people, who many of whom had come to 
to, to prospect for gold during the gold rush of the middle of the 19th century. And they especially had come to work on the transcontinental railroad that was built in the first couple of decades after, after the middle of the, of the century and Chinese laborers did a huge percentage of the work that went into the building of the Transcontinental Continental Railroad. In 1882, they were met with a degree of ingratitude that was really new for um, American history and the Chinese were basically blamed. They were basically blamed for unemployment that set in after 1870. They were blamed for a drop in wages that set in after, after 1870. They had nothing to do with this. This was a worldwide phenomenon known as the Long Depression of the, of the 19th century between 1873 or so and, and 1895. You had this depression that reduced wages, it reduced prices. And no one really quite understood or very few people quite understood why this was happening. And so writers, journalists, politicians looked around for someone to blame and they settled on Chinese people, the Chinese immigrants. And so in 1882, all well, most further immigration by people from China was barred. It didn't quite end all immigration of Chinese people because if you could show that you weren't a laborer, then you had a chance of coming in. And so here you see, this is a, a, a newspaper published by a trade union, a big labor union, and they are thrilled about the Chinese exclusion because there was a fear on the part of labor leaders that the Chinese laborers coming in had diluted the labor force, reduced wages, and the labor unions, like other political leaders, blamed Chinese for something that actually, in fact, was not their fault. And so, as I mentioned, well, this is a little, this kind of, kind of faint here, but this is the San Francisco Bay, this is Angel Island, and this is the West Coast equivalent of Ellis Island. This is where people from China first landed as on their way into the United States, and they were subject on, Ellis, on uh, Angel Island to an extremely rigorous form of evaluation, a medical evaluation that barred just about all Chinese people after 1882 from coming in to the United States. And so you had a very large percentage of the Chinese who wanted to come to the United States but who were sent back home after this examination on Angel Island. Now, as far as Japanese immigrants were concerned, they weren't excluded at first. In the late 19th and early 20th century, potential Japanese immigrants were subjected to a quota system. That is, there was a certain number of Japanese who would be allowed in. But in 1917, all Japanese immigration was halted as well. The idea was that people from Asia were incapable of assimilating to American society and American culture. So that this first really effort to bar people from coming into the United States, so we have a whole century of almost completely open immigration for anybody who could be defined as white, and that included Chinese and Japanese people. In 1882, that sort of blanket acceptance of people was cut off. And that Exclusion Act coincided with a new wave of immigration. And so just as immigration was being halted from Asia, it was completely opened up from parts of Europe that hadn't sent people very much to the United States before. That is, from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe and Russia, suddenly in the 1870s and picking up in the 1880s and 1890s in the first decade of the 20th century, you had a flood of people coming into the United States. The numbers are really quite startling. Between 1871 and 1900, nearly 12 million people from Eastern Europe arrived. And then between 1901 and 1920, the total jumped to 14.5 million. And unlike, and this is what's important about this, 
this wave, this new wave of immigration from Europe, unlike the early European immigration, the new people came largely from southern and eastern Europe, pl places like Italy, Greece, Russia, and Austria-Hungary. The majority of these new immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th century were Catholics, Orthodox Christians, and Jews, groups that were disfavored, it was widely seen as not fitting into the United States, but despite this, 99% of all those who came to the United States during this period were allowed in. Almost nobody was sent back. As about only 1% of those who wanted to come in from Eastern Europe were sent back. So you have this really kind of strange contradiction. On the one hand, People are coming in and they're, they're, they're met with a lot of hostility. A, a lot of old stock Americans are upset, but essentially everyone is allowed in. And so you, you see scenes like, like this. The vast number of people herded into the steerage that is the, the bottom level of a ship, piling into these ships, crossing the Atlantic, and coming to the United States. And, Photographs of, of people looking into the in, into the America, sort of waiting anxiously to see what's going to be there for them, and people arriving off the boat with all of their possessions in a suitcase or two, moving into the re immigration reception facility at Ellis Island that opened in 1892, waiting patiently in line to be inspected by the immigration officers. And here's a, here's a shot of Ellis Island from a distance, and you have these long lines. It's almost worse than waiting to have your passport stamped coming into an airport nowadays. You have long lines of people waiting to be inspected, and they're, they're in a kind of holding pens here inside Ellis Island as they are moving toward the, the inspectors. The average inspection took 45 seconds. 45 seconds, and so again, even though there was a lot of worry about all the people coming in, the, 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 the effort to exclude people was essentially non-existent. A quick look, and then you were in. And so here you, you see people walking across a sort of makeshift bridge from Ellis Island into the United States of America. And so, the more people came in, the numbers approached a million a year after the churn of the, of the 20th century. The more people came in, the more vocal the worries about how the new immigrants were changing the American society and, and, and America itself, the more worries got expressed. And one of the things that I, I discovered really to, to my great surprise when I when I wrote my book on the history of the, the Statue of Liberty, I discovered that the first images of the Statue of Liberty, which, which I, like everybody else, associate with a welcome to immigration, a welcome to people who are coming from abroad, actually the first images of the Statue of Liberty were of xenophobia, of hostility to immigration. And here you see a typical one. Judge magazine was a sort of satirical magazine. It was like the national lampoon of the, of the late 19th century. And what you see is a Statue of Liberty hiking up her skirts because this flag says European garbage ship because the garbage, that is the immigrants of Europe, are being dumped at her feet, shoveled there, solying the poor Statue of Liberty. This, these are the first images that we see in the United States of the Statue of Liberty. Here's another one. And wh what do you see written across here? The dregs of Europe. And what the Statue of Liberty, she's got the torch in the crook of her arm because she has to hold her nose. And what she's carrying here is a bottle of carbolic acid, which was the best, which was the best uh, decon uh, this disinfectant that existed at that time. And so here's the Statue of Liberty, horrified by all the people who were coming in. Another, another cartoon from the end of the, of the 19th century, and this is the boss, the political boss of New York City, and it shows him as enjoying 
the stat the, all these immigrants having ruined the Statue of Liberty because the boss is going to be able to organize all these immigrants to vote for him and to be able to stay in power. And here you see a caricature of a Wall Street guy who is going to take advantage of all these immigrants to make money and make himself even richer. And so here you can see some of the, the, the imagery of opposition to the massive wave of immigration coming in in the late 19th and early 20th century. And here you see another, our, what the caption is down here, it says, our Statue of Liberty, she can't stand it. All these immigrants are working to pull her down. And so you see this in the popular culture, you see this in the press, but you also see it in some of the most prominent elite groups in the United States. In 1882, Thomas Bailey Aldrich, who was editor of the Atlantic magazine, wrote a verse that he characterized to a friend, and I'm quoting Aldrich, he characterized his verse to a friend as, quote, a protest against America becoming a cesspool of Europe. Aldrich titled his poem, Unguarded Gates, and it features the Statue of Liberty as a guardian of American purity. The poem condemns, and I've highlighted the, the, the most significant lines, it condemns the wild motley throng pouring in, those bringing with them unknown gods and rights, those tiger passions here to stretch their claws. And then turning to the, the Statue of Liberty itself, Aldrich writes, O Liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? Is it well, that is, for her to let all those dark Italians, Greeks, Jews, and Poles through, all those strangers, as the poem says, with accents of menace, alien to our air, voices that once the Tower of Babel knew. To Aldrich and many others, these four aliens with their foreign values would supposedly bring the United States down. A few years later, one of the country's most prominent sociologists, a man named Edward A. Ross, he claimed, and I'm quoting him, and this is going to be, he uses some purple prose, so this is going to be really tough for the translator. But Edward A. Ross claimed, quote, that the physiognomy of certain groups unmistakably proclaims inferiority. That is, you could see their inferi inferiority on their face. And here he goes on, he says, in every face, something is wrong. There are so many sugar loaf heads, moon faces, slit mouths, lantern jaws, and goose bill noses that one might imagine a malicious genie had amused herself by creating human beings in a set of skew molds discarded by the creator. All of these voices, the cartoons, the, the, the poems, the sociologists created a powerful clamor for the first time in American history for the restriction of immigration. Political organizations formed to try to block further immigration to this country. One of the most prominent, one, prominent ones, and the name is revealing, was called the American Protective Association. Even more important was a revived Ku Klux Klan. In the Ku Klux Klan, as you know, first began right during the Reconstruction as an anti-black terrorist organization, but the Klan surfaced, it resurfaced after the First World War as an extremist fraternal organization, a kind of lion's club in white sheets and hoods. This new Ku Klux Klan was less violent than the original one, but it still attacked African Americans and it was at least as hostile to Catholics as it was to black Americans, and to a lesser extent, it was hostile to Jews as well. At its height, the revived Ku Klux Klan in 1924 had four million members. It played a massive role in the push for immigration restriction of the 1920s, and the Klan, along with the American Federation of Labor, which was the most important organization of labor unions, 
They fought to close the doors to America to all non-Protestants from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. And here you see, a, here, well, here's a picture of a Klan family on an outing. And this was a mainstream organization with four million members in 1924. And but here you see a particularly vulgar cartoon from the Ku Klux Klan newspaper, We Can't Digest the Scum. The melting pot is melting all kinds of undesirables into the United States. And, and so all these views then ended up in two pieces of legislation, one in 1921 and then the more important one in 1924, which effectively choked off the immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe that had been such a huge phenomenon in the decades before. The, the official name of the, the 1924 law is called the Johnson Reed Act, or more popularly known as the Immigration Exclusion Act. And what this act would do is to limit the number of immigrants to 150,000 a year, a fraction of what there had been. There had been about a million a year in the years before the First World War. And even more important, the, this new act of 1924, it established quotas on immigrants based on national origins. And so what it did is it created a hierarchy of desirable and undesirable people that would be allowed into the United States. And so the quotas were based on the number of people from each national group living in the United States in 1890. Well, in 1890, there still weren't very many people from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. There still weren't very many people from Russia or, or Italy or, or Greece or, or, or Turkey. And so when you created a quota system that was based on those, on those numbers, you got a very small number of people. The, the quotas said that 2% of the number of people from each nation living in the United States in 1890, only 2% of that number would be allowed in every year from 1924 on. Those numbers were revised slightly upward, but they're still startlingly low. And so here's a, here's a statistic for you from 1929. And so this act set up a, a, a number of slots for immigrants from each country. And in 1929, the number of slots for Italy, Spain, Portugal, Poland, Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Greece, Hungary, Romania, Yugoslavia, and Russia all together totaled 18,408 people. All together, all those countries. For comparison, the number of people from Britain and Ireland who would be allowed in was 83,500, and from Germany, 26,000. So the number of British people, Irish people, and Germans exceeded the number of people from all those other countries by a factor of five. And this was deliberately built into this new immigration legislation of 1924, a hierarchy of desirable people, British, Irish, German, and much less desirable people, that is those from, from Eastern Europe. Essentially, no Asians or Africans were allowed in after the middle of the 1920s, and although Mexicans did continue to cross the border and come into the United States in fairly large numbers in the 1920s, there were also large numbers of Mexicans who were deported in the 1930s. Here's a graph that shows you, over time, where the immigrants came from. And so you can, you can see here Germany and Ireland, the United Kingdom, and as you get into the late 19th century, well, it, it, starts, it starts to change pretty drastically. Italy, Russia, Hungary, and you go on and on and on, and I'll get to this in a, in a few minutes. Finally, in the late 20th century, that's when you start getting very large numbers of people from Mexico. And so you can see how the national origins of the immigrant population changes over time and up until about the middle of the 20th century, this was by design. It was designed to favor these folks and not these folks. And here you can see a graph of the share of the immigrant population 
as a percent of the total. And so in 1910, about almost 15% of the American population had been born abroad. And in 2013, 13%. So fairly consistent at the margins, early 20th century, 2013, a dip starting in the, eight, the 1920s all the way down to the 1960s when there's new legislation, which I'll get to in a minute, and that brings the number back up. Now, there's a real paradox. There's an irony to the exclusion of immigrants, and what that, what that, what that irony is, what that paradox is, is that those people who were already here in the wake of the exclusion of newcomers, they then started to enjoy a much higher level of acceptance than they ever had before. Suddenly now, with immigration largely cut off, the existing population that had been born abroad, they could then start to find more acceptance because there wasn't the threat anymore of massive immigration. And so during this period, the late 1920s and the 1930s, the children of immigrants went to American schools, they, they did American sports, they got involved in American popular culture, they, they got involved in patterns of consumption, they became Americanized. And so by the 1930s, when there is very little further immigration of supposedly undesirable people, the interesting thing that happens is that the people already here from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, they begin to enjoy a considerable degree of acceptance. And they begin to be defined as real Americans, as white Americans, as people who belong in the United States and who could and did assimilate into American culture. And in turn, the members of the groups now enjoying much greater acceptance, well, they then found themselves much more happy about their status in the United States, much more, they found themselves much more accepting of the American society that had scorned them up until now. And I just wanna read you a passage from Abraham Kahan's novel about the, an, an impoverished Jewish immigrant who rises and makes a success of himself and he becomes a really wealthy clothing manufacturer. The, the novel's called The Rise of David Levinsky. And here's what the, the narrator says about the Jews who have come into the United States. He says, they're, they're, they, they've listened to a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem, and here's what the narrator says. There was a jingle of newly acquired dollars in our applause, but there was something else in it as well. Many of those who are now paying tribute to the stars and stripes, the American flag, were listening to the tune with grave, solemn mien. As it was as if they were saying, we are not persecuted under the flag. At last we have found a home and love for America blazed up in our souls. And so as the immigrants were more accepted in this period when further immigration has largely been cut off, then those immigrants in turn begin to express really positive feelings about the United States. And it's in this period, the 1930s, and into the Second World War, it's only now that the Statue of Liberty becomes associated with a welcome to immigrants from abroad. It's only in the 1930s that the imagery of the Statue of Liberty changes from hostility to immigration to open arms, a welcome to people who are seeking a new life and a second chance in the United States. It's only in the 1930s that the Statue of Liberty comes to stand definitively for the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And one of the things that the, the New Deal does is it, it starts to, 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 to um, interview immigrants and ask them what they felt when they first saw the Statue of Liberty. And here's a drawing that's in the, the National Park Service, which is the conservator of the of the, the Statue of Liberty, and, and here's just a couple of quotes, typical quotes, from, from immigrants who were asked in the 1930s to say what they felt about the statue and about America. 
And here's one from a man named Arnold Weiss. He said, seeing the Statue of Liberty was the greatest thing I've ever seen. I said to myself, gee, we're in America. Now I can go out in the street and pick up gold. An immigrant named Sarah Asher coming from Russia, she told an, an interviewer that she had gotten up at 5 a.m. on the boat that she was sailing into the United States on and she joined her fellow passengers. And here's what she told the interviewer, quote, the sunshine started and what do we see? The Statue of Liberty. Well, she was beautiful with the early morning light. Everybody was crying. The whole boat bent toward her and everybody was crying. Suddenly, the positive views, the attachment to the United States from the Im immigrants who had been largely scorned until now, suddenly in the 1930s and into the 1940s, the immigrants were encouraged to express positive feelings they did and the culture at large now began to see immigration as a good thing, a very good thing. And this would continue on until the very recent times. Now, so by the beginning of the Second World War, there are much more positive feelings toward European immigrants from the South and the, and the East than there had ever been before, but there's a caveat. And this caveat is one of the most shameful episodes in American history, and it shows that despite better feelings about immigrants that the old hostilities didn't completely go away. During the Second World War, as many of you know, 120,000 Japanese immigrants were interned in prison camps. Many of them were American citizens. They were interned in prison camps because the fear supposedly was that they would be a fifth column against the United States. What's interesting about this, and one of the many things that's troubling about this is that the German Americans and Italian Americans did not suffer the same sort of a discrimination, even though their native countries were at war with the United States, just like Japan was. And you see Japanese Americans being crowded behind barbed wire into internment camps, and here you see a sign of the, the prejudice against Japanese Americans that you saw during the Second World War. These were internment camps. They, 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 they were nothing like the concentration camps, of course, that existed in, in Germany and Eastern Europe during the, the same period. But nonetheless, American citizens of Japanese descent were herded behind barbed wire for many of the years of the Second World War. Now, with the end of that war, the United States sort of overall disposition tilted back in favor of immigration. The war had created a large number of displaced people in Europe, millions of people who had no country to go to. And to its great credit, the United States took care of millions of those people. They created places for the displaced persons to go and the United States paid to feed them and house them and clothe them. And the United States also agreed in the late 1940s and 1950s to accept into the country a large number of people who had been displaced in Europe during the Second World War. Nearly a million displaced persons were admitted to the United States between 1948 and 1953. And then a couple years later, in the wake of the failed Hungarian Revolution, about 30,000 Hungarians who were fleeing the communist regime there, they were welcomed into the United States. And then three years later, in the wake of the Cuban Revolution of 1959, over 200,000 Cubans who were fleeing Castro's communist regime, they too were welcomed into the United States. And so by 1960, you have an America that is welcoming people with open arms, displaced Europeans, Hungarians, Cubans who want a better life in the United States. The US was prosperous during those years and American leaders and opinion makers believed that the country could absorb these newcomers. By the 1960s, most leaders of the Democratic Party favored immigration, as did a large number of Republicans. So too did the leaders of the Catholic Church and even more interestingly, the main labor unions now embraced immigration 
labor leaders saw immigrants not anymore in the 1960s as competitors for jobs, but as people to organize and to make the labor movement stronger. Labor unions who had been earlier on one of the most hostile groups to immigrants, now in the 1960s in the midst of the post-World War II prosperity, they welcomed immigrants with open arms because they were a new group who could be organized. And so these positive feelings toward immigration, a bipartisan support for immigration, led in 1965 under President Lyndon Johnson to the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And that act got rid of that quota system that was created in 1924 and opened up the country to a new wave of immigrants, opened up the country to new people who wanted to come to the United States and make a better life there. And so you can see the, a, a graph of the, 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 the number of immigrants. And so this is the number of immigrants as a percent of the population in the middle of the 19th century is about 10%, stays, it goes up to about 15%. It dips sharply after the Immigration Exclusion Act of 1924 and then begins to rise sharply after the new legislation of 1965. And in terms of the absolute number of immigrants, you can see the, clo the, the curve here, stabilization down, and then shooting upwards after 1965. And you get the, the political leaders thought that they would get about three or 400,000 new immigrants every year, but what they didn't reckon with was the downturn of the international economy after 1970. People throughout Asia and Africa and Latin America began to experience extremely difficult economic situation. And as it happened with Europeans earlier in the, in, the, in the 20th century, toward the end of the 19th century, now people from Asia and Africa and Latin America saw that the United States beckoned to them and they came in large numbers to the United States fleeing difficult economic circumstances, often difficult political circumstances, and came into an America that seemed after 1965 to want them. And the numbers are huge. Between 1971 and 1986, 7.3 million people came in, or about half a million a year. In the 1990s, those numbers went up to about a million a year. And so in the 1990s, the absolute number of people came, coming into the United States exceeded the numbers of the huge wage of immigration from the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Now, one sort of ominous, difficult thing in this new wave of, of immigrants coming in in the, in the 1990s and the 2000s is that very many of them were unauthorized. That is, they were coming in illegally. They didn't have legal status. Between, it's estimated that between 2000 and 2006, about eight million people came in. Half of them were unauthorized immigrants. Between 2000 and 2010, there were probably, and no one knows exactly the number, but there were as many as 12 million unauthorized immigrants who residing in the United States. Now, this was a population easily exploited by businessmen looking for cheap labor, looking for, for a docile labor force that was in no position to protest difficult conditions. And it's the situation that has created the, the new controversies that we're living in right now. Here you see a, uh, here a <coughs> graph of the number of on unauthorized immigrants. These are naturalized American citizens. These are people who've come in lawfully. You can see that the number of unauthorized immigrants is about the same as the number of authorized immigrants. 11 to 12 million people, it's a very large group. And this is the situation that confronts us in the world we live in now. These immigrants, authorized and unauthorized, changed the, the ethnic character of the United States. In the 18, 1980s and 1990s, 13 percent of the immigrants came from Europe and 82 percent came from Asia and Latin America. 
In the past, essentially all the immigrants had come from Europe. Now, most of them were coming from outside of Europe. The top 10 sending nations in the waning years of the 20th century in order were Mexico, the Philippines, Vietnam, China, Taiwan, the Dominican Republic, Korea, India, the former Soviet Union, Jamaica, and Iran. This group really started to change the, the character of the United States. In 1980, 80% of the population of the United States were descendants of Europeans. It's projected that by 2050, almost half of the American population will be people whose origins are not of European descent. Almost half of the population by 2050 will be not of European descent. Now, these numbers in the context of the post-2008 economic crisis has reignited the debate over immigration that had been largely quiet since the Second World War. And so you've seen the huge debate over immigration that begins in the 1890s and extends up until the middle of the 1920s. It calms down after the uh, quote is placed on immigrants coming in and in the wake of the Second World War and American prosperity, there is a new openness to immigration. More immigrants come in, large numbers of immigrants come in, but by the beginning of the 2000s, the sentiment begins to change and in serious ways. And so you'd have to be Rip Van Winkle asleep for more than 20 years not to be aware of the debate that's going on around us about immigration. Some of the, the people opposed to further immigration echo the arguments that were made in the 19th century that immigration is changing the character of the United States beyond recognition. And then you have the allegation that, that immigrants are criminals, that their rate of crime is higher than the rate of crime of Americans. And you have the allegation that immigrants are drawing welfare and other forms of social spending in higher percentages than Americans do. None of this is true, but this is an argument that is made and believed by a large number of people. What may be true, is that in certain categories of employment, especially at low levels of skill and low levels of education, in those categories it may be true, the demographers disagree about this, but it may be true that, in, that immigration has created a competition for jobs that results in fewer jobs for American citizens. And it may also be true. The evidence is, is a little murky, but it may also be true that in these categories of jobs, relatively low skill job levels, the presence of unauthorized immigrants has driven wages down. And so this is what has ignited the debate, a debate that swirls around us, a debate, as you all know, that was crucial to the presidential election of 2016. And it's a debate that plays out in the courts and along the border with Mexico every day. The debate, the debate is there and the vast attention given to dreamers, the children brought to the United States illegally, but who grew up in America and know no other country. The debate is there in the reality that there are millions of unauthorized immigrants living and working in the United States, raising families there and participating in American society, in many cases for decades, but having to do it under the, under the shadow of their illegality. And so to conclude, if you'll permit me to end with an opinion, with, with my own personal point of view, it seems to me that something has to be done to regularize the situation of these 12 million or so unauthorized immigrants. Something has to be done to give these folks who have been contributing to American society, something has to be done, it seems to me, to give them a path, a path to citizenship and the possibility of living normal lives. Now, this is not an argument in favor of completely open immigration. Every country has the right to control its border. The argument that I'm making in conclusion is that the unauthorized immigrants who are already here should be given a chance to live lawful American lives. Unfortunately, our political gridlock has long blocked any solution to this situation
but I don't see how a solution can be blocked forever. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I would like to know what solution do you propose for the unauthorized people that are in the U.S. at the moment? That, that, that's a great question. That's an essential question. If I, if I had a perfect answer to that, maybe I would be in, in, in Washington, in Washington. <laughs> discussing it. But, but it, it seems to me that, that the, 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 the kind of phrase of art is a path to citizenship. And so some way of, of, of allowing people who are here illegally but have been contributing Sorry about that. Yeah. So, I, <clears throat> when, I, when I teach, I try not to stand behind the podium, but you, 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 gotta, you gotta hear me. So the, the, the question was, what solution do I propose to the, the large numbers of un, unauthorized immigrants? And, and so the, I think the, the best thing would be for Congress to pass legislation that would provide a path to citizenship for people who have been here for a long time. And, and what, what you might do is, is ask people to demonstrate how long they've been here. And the people who've been here, say, for more than a decade, I, I think that they, they should have the right to move very quickly towards citizenship. And they would, they, they would do the, the things that any person who's going to be naturalized has to do. There's, there's a test and there, there are various things. And so maybe I would, I, I would structure it so that the longer you've been in the United States, the easier your path to citizenship would be. And so that people who haven't been here very long, have been in the United States for very long, they would have to wait. Because one of the dangers, of course, is, of offering a path to citizenship to unauthorized immigrants is that would encourage a huge number of new people from coming in. And so that's why I would, I would think about something like that. And so that you would know that if you haven't been in the United States for very long, you're not going to be able to become a citizen very quickly and maybe not at all. Okay. Thank you. Bonjour. Euh, J'aurais préféré poser ma question en français, mais je vais essayer de vous la poser en, en anglais. Je sais que vous parlez un, un français parfait. Uh, I would like to know what do you think about this hypocrisy of uh, uh, this quite massive immigration we are witnesses of nowadays, well, from Syria, Libya, Iraq, and all that, because it's all about economics. When uh, there's crisis, we focus on immigration. For example, this huge number, 44.7 million total US foreign born population. I ask myself, when are you cons considered as a, a real American? Especially when we know that all Americans are immigrants. In um, uh, uh, so are, are we, uh, our destiny, it's, it's, it's going to be always like this, that uh, uh, because the politicians and the economists, they know that we need immigration. For example, from Spain on, Germany, Italy, they all need immigration. 
at least to pay the, the, the retired persons or to, uh, to, to participate in the growth of the economy of the country. This, this is statistics. Europe and United States, they, they can't survive without immigration. But uh, uh, the, the politicians and the economists, they know that. But the, the people, they don't know that. And they don't let them to, to know that. Maybe it could change a little bit the, the, the vision of the people to immigration. Immigration is a good thing. It's, it's, uh, it participates in the welfare of the, of, the, of the countries. But still this hypocrisy, are we going to, to stay for, or it's a just a question of course, maybe beyond the crisis, things would change a little bit. So, Thank you. So that's a great question, and that really plays back into the, the debate over immigration that has gone on not only in, in the United States, but in every country that is, that receives immigrants, and, and that is, what does it mean to be in a, a member of a particular society? Who gets to count? And we're, we're talking about the United States, so who gets to count as an American? And throughout American history, there really have been two opposing views of this. There's one view that is as, as an ethnic and religious and to some extent racial view and that there are certain ethnicities and certain races that don't count. But what's interesting is that who gets to count as an American has changed over time. And so in our, in our current situation, it is to a large extent people from the Middle East who were seen as not good potential for assimilation to America. And so is it always gonna be like this? I don't think so. Because history suggests, I, I, like, I wanna be an optimist ab about this, and history suggests that the United States is open enough and expansive enough to be able to change its understanding of, of who can count. Now it's more difficult in Europe because one of the things that the Second World War did is to create very uniform countries ethnically all throughout. Before the Second World War, in virtually every major country, there were people of varying ethnicity. So in, in Poland, before the, the Second World War, 30% of the population were not ethnic Poles. The same was, was true of, 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 of the Soviet Union, of, of, of course, but all throughout Eastern Europe. What you had as a result of the Second World War is the homogenization of the population. And so you had built up between 1945 and the early years of the 2000s no experience of diversity of any sort in these countries, Scandinavian countries, Germany, and especially in Eastern Europe. And so it's a shock to the systems of these countries to have people come in who are not Christians, who are ethnically different and diverse, and to come into a, country's, a country that has been accustomed over a half a century to a uniform ethnic population, it makes it very difficult for the public at large to feel that they can welcome this new group. Now, I agree with you that from the, 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 the point of view of a lot of politicians, they want immigrants, especially in a country like Germany. Their, their reproduction rate does not replace the population. And so if you don't have immigration in, in Germany, the population is going to fall and Germany is going to weaken. And so Germany absolutely needs immigrants. But from the point of view of a population that has, is not accustomed to r diversity, it's very hard for them to accept that. And th this makes the situation easier in the United States because for all of the discrimination, for all the hostility, for all the debate about immigration in this country, Americans have become used to a place that can accommodate new people. We have had the experience of being able to bring in people from all, all over the world and for them to become Americans. First of all, I would like to thank you for your brilliant uh, lecture. Is it possible for you to clarify the new administrative process that new immigrants undergo under the President Trump administration? So, so the question is, 
can I clarify the position on immigration of the, of the, of the new administration? Yes, please. And so I, I want I, I to, I'm going to try to be as neutral about this as, as I can. I'm not a great fan of the current administration, but as, 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 I, under, as I understand the, the, the position of the Trump administration on, on immigration, there is a worry that the large numbers of undocumented immigrants are competing for jobs with working class Americans who have already lost their jobs as a result of globalization. And so there is the sense not only that immigration or uh, immigrants are competing for jobs among people who are already hurting economically, but there's a fear as well that the immigrants are bringing down wages for a population whose wages are already going down. And so there's a real problem. Now, I'm not a fan of the way this problem is being characterized. I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of the way that, that, that economic problems that are not the fault of the immigrant population are essentially ascribed to them. But, but I think that if you want to get at the core of what, the, what President Trump's position is and what the position of the people who support him is that immigration is hurting people economically who are already hurting through no fault of their own. And the previous administrations from, from Clinton to Bush to Obama, they didn't do anything for this group and they want a president who will. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, I just want to, I have just one question about, uh, I don't know, I, I always ask myself why U.S. Uh, didn't succeed to overcome this problem of uh, discrimination and racism. Because in every time I had assist uh, to like these uh, lectures about U.S. and the, uh, its relation with uh, immigration and always they they always talk about this problem you know we know all that uh, black people suffer the the racism you know and i don't know why in 2018 we still talk about this problem why us didn't uh, succeed to come through to overcome this problem thanks once again the, the, the question is, why has the United States been unable to overcome racism? And boy, if I could answer that, that question, that, I mean, in, in all I can say about that is that in a lot of ways, racism is the original sin of the United States. It allowed for the institution of slavery and for that institution to exist for a very long time and then it allowed, even after the end of slavery, for a sort of formal kind of discrimination against African Americans that lasted in parts of the United States until the 1960s. And so why, why was that true? I, I, that, that there is a gigantic psychological literature that tries to explain the persistence of, of racial prejudice. There, are historians who, who have, have tried to, to do that, and it, there's, there, there's, there's, no, there's, there's no simple answer to it. And some of it has to do with, with traditions. There are parts of the country where racial prejudice is embedded in the, in the culture, and it's very hard to change those cultures. There's, there are parts of the country where, because I mean, in a, in a way, racism feeds on itself. And so racism has made it difficult for a lot of American history for African Americans to move up in society, to be educated, to have important jobs. And so uh, a person with racial prejudice will be able to say, well, look, you have all of these African Americans and they're not doing anything. They're not getting educated and it shows that they are not at the same level as white Americans. And so this is probably one of the reasons for the persistence 
of racial discrimination is that it creates, racism itself creates a set of perceptions that justifies further racism. Now, all that said, I want to emphasize that things have changed an awful lot in the last half century. The, the civil rights movement of the 1960s and the legislation that, that came in after that has really changed attitudes enormously. And it's changed possibilities and, and opportunities. And everybody, everybody says this about, about Barack Obama, but it would have been unimaginable 50 years ago that there could be a president of the United States of African American origins or African origins. And so while saying at the same time and being uh, sort of deploring the persistence of racism, at the same time, I don't want to give a totally negative impression. The United States has made great progress in a situation in which there is a set of racial prejudices that are built into American culture and have been there right from the beginning. Um, hi. First of all, thanks for your lecture. I thought it was very interesting. Um, we're from Holland, and we sort of have an immigration debate as well. And a lot of white right-wing um, political parties, they sort of operate on the idea that um, other cultures, especially the Arabic one, they create a threat, they propose a threat to our culture. And I, uh, I just want to know what you think of that. Um, yeah, that fear, sort of. So the, 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 the question is, in the, in, the, in the Netherlands, there are right-wing politicians and others who argue that, that, that people who come in from, from the Middle East, especially Muslims, create a threat to the existing culture. And I don't think that's true. But, um, but I, I, my... You know, my sort of professional job as a historian is, is to try not to judge, but to try to explain. And I think the explanation for this sort of hostility that exists in the Netherlands, as in Germany, as in Eastern Europe, is what I mentioned a few, a few minutes ago, that the lack of experience with diversity. And so you, you don't have experience with diversity. You're not accustomed to living among people who have a different religion from you, who look different from you, who have a different set of attitudes and, and, and cultures. And so because you're not, ex you're, you're not experienced with that, you don't understand it, it's pretty common to fear it. You fear what you don't understand. Now, it has to be said, too, that the, the terrorism that we've seen is a factor here. I mean, we have, we, have to, we have to be honest about, about that, it, seem, it seems to me, and that, that unfortunately that there are a, a, a certain number of acts of terror that come from a particular population, and that fuels this fear. Now, it's often the case that the, the prevalence of terrorism is exaggerated. It's a, a minuscule phenomenon, and it obviously doesn't only come from Islamic people. But in the context of a fear of people who are different, terrorism then gets played up, and it can then serve to exaggerate the fear, especially since it is a real danger. Hello. Um, you've, ta you've spoken about the um, uh, immigrants who uh, go to America to have. Uh, hello. <laughs> Sorry, but um, the Im the immigrants who go to America, uh, they have to adapt to uh, become an American citizen to live the American life, uh, um, and in that way give up uh, their culture. But to what extent does they um, can they? Um, maintain their own culture and uh, to what extent does America adapt to their or uh, is influenced by their culture? So that's, that's a great question. I mean, that's one of the essential questions and, and, and that is that, that do, do immigrants have to adapt to American culture and in doing that to drop their own culture? 
And I think one of the strengths of the United States is, as it's evolved over the 20th century, is that it has become possible to be accepted as an American and also to maintain your cultural roots. This is unusual. I mean, if you compare with France, for example, in, in to, to, to be French, to become French, has always meant, and it still means, although it's being contested nowadays, but it is meant that you have to conform to the dominant understanding of what it means to be French. This is why the, you're forbidden to delineate the population according to ethnic origins. The, the French census is not allowed to distinguish people according to the, the, the places that they originated from. And that's because there is this notion that you can't be Italian and French, you can't be Syrian and French, you can't be Armenian and, and, and French. The, there, there is a debate on this question in the United States and there are certainly people who have and still believe that if you're going to be an American you have to conform to the dominant culture but I don't think that is the, is the, is the most prominent position. Most Americans have come to believe since so, so many Americans of course come from families that have immigrated relatively recently, most Americans have come to believe I think that you can be an American without having to drop the culture of your origins. Now what tends to happen over the generations is that, and this is I think a tragedy in a way, what tends to happen is people lose the languages of their families who have immigrated to the United States. They lose the languages and they lose the culture. And so there's been a kind of heritage movement in the, in the last couple of decades to encourage people not to lose that, that culture. And, and so over the generations, the tendency is to blend into American society and drop the old cultures. And it would be a good thing, it seems to me, if people didn't lose those cultural origins, including the linguistic ones. Uh, first of all, thank you for your lecture. Um, what do you expect would be, uh, if there will be any, uh, ne the next uh, fourth big wave of immigrants that will come to America? So what do I think is going to be the next big wave of immigrants to come to the United States? Boy, that, that's, a, that's a hard one. That's a really hard one. I, what, I would th what I would think is that the, 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 the people who are going to be coming to the United States are going to be pretty consistent in the future with what they've been in the last few decades. And that is they're going to come from Latin America and they're going to come from a variety of Asian cultures and as, as, especially Korea, China, and, and Japan. And I, it, it's, you know, it, <coughs> I'm a historian, so I have a hard enough time predicting the past, let alone sort of imagining what the future is, 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 going, to, is, is going to look like. But there is such a demand from especially people in Latin America. It is really relatively easy, of course, to get to the United States from, from Latin America. And there are circuits of communication that connect China and Korea in particular the Philippines with the, the United States. And I think those, those channels will, will guarantee that people will continue to come from those places. Now, how hospitable is the United States gonna be? That I can't begin to predict because it's so much based on a political climate and it's also based on the economy. One generalization that you can make about American history is that when the economy is good, the worries about immigration subside substantially and when the economy is bad all of a sudden there's a resurgence of, of worries and so I think the the reception of immigrants and the places they come from is going to be a function of the nature of the American economy and if it's good there will be lots of immigrants if it isn't there won't. Hi. Um, you talked about quotas in your lecture, 
and I was wondering if there are still qu quotas for several countries for immigrants, like are there more Germans allowed than um, Moroccan? Thank you for that question. So the question is, are there, are there still quotas? And the, an the answer is no. I mean, the, the, the formal quotas have been abolished. And this is one of the things that the, the Trump administration has, begin, has begun to introduce, uh, not as, as a form of legislation, but the president has introduced the idea that some immigrants are more desirable than others. And this would be a big change. It has, that hasn't been the case. The idea that there are quotas, that some immigrants are more desirable than, than others, officially, hasn't been the case since the 1920s. Unofficially, of course, there are, there are widespread beliefs that some groups are more, are, are, are more desirable than others. But as a matter of policy, and it hasn't become the policy of the current administration, although there are hints about it, but as a, as a matter of policy, there, haven't been, there hasn't been a hierarchy since the 1920s. Well, no, I mean, this is, the, the 1920s is when the legislation was passed. There hasn't been a hierarchy since 1965 with the legislation that lifted the quotas. There have been no quotas since 1965. Thank you for this very interesting lecture. Um, my concern is about the impact of immigration on the relationship between the West and predominantly Western uh, Muslim countries, sorry. Does the extent to which a certain group immigrates or do not immigrate to these countries have an impact, a negative uh, impact perhaps, on this relationship? Thank you. So, so your question is, is about the, the, the impact of immigration and, and attitudes toward immigration on the Muslim world. Is that right? Not only on the Muslim world, but on the relationship as a whole that uh, reigns between the predominantly Muslim societies and the West. Oh, okay. Thanks. Well, so it's a, it's a, it's a really important question, and, and I think that, that negative attitudes toward, toward the immigration of Muslims to Western countries has severely harmed the relationship between the West and the Islamic world. And so for, the, for Western countries to be conveying the idea that, that Muslims are not welcome in their countries this is a terrible thing for relationships between the West and the Islamic world, and it's understandable that people throughout the, the, the Muslim world would be upset about these attitudes that seem so negative toward a very large group of people. And in fact, if you, if, if you look at the Muslim population of the United States, it's a population that's extremely well integrated very successful and has lived in peace in the United States for, for quite a long time. It's a relatively small group, but it's not that small. And it's only in, in recent years, and especially after 9-11, after that, the, that, the, that that issue has even become something that, that Americans have talked about. Good evening. Thanks for your lecture. Um, you've used the word melting pot while describing America's society. My question is the following. In what way does America's exceptionalism justify its assimilation acts? Thank you. In what way does America's, does America's exceptionalism uh, justify its assimilation acts? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I want to see if I understand the question. So what, in what way does American exceptionalism... Oh, it's exclusion, it's exclusion act? Oh, okay. So, the, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great question, it's a complicated question, and so the, the melting pot imagery has has had a lot of different meanings o over time. And so 
the, the early on in the early 20th century, immigrants embraced the, the idea of a, of a melting pot because they thought that that to melt into American society would be to be accepted by that society. And later on, as, as you could see from some of the things I said about Henry Ford, the idea of a melting pot became a way to exclude people. It became a way of saying that there were certain people who can't melt into the United States. And so, on the issue of American exceptionalism, unfortunately, the United States is not exceptional on the question of excluding people. When the United States passed the Immigrant Exclusion Act in 1924, exactly the same time, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Brazil, and Argentina all passed legislation that was very much like that, except even more stringent. And so, you have the, the United States, and this is of course not to ex justify what the United States has done, but in the 1920s, the United States existed in a context of the exclusion of immigrants that was far from unique to this country. And so there is nothing, unfortunately, except, uh, exceptional about the effort to exclude certain people from coming in to the country. Hey again. Uh, my question uh, came uh, into my mind after uh, the intervening of uh, all people. Uh, my question is, uh, couldn't we argue that uh, the U.S. immigration problem is caused partially by the U.S. itself, by its way of uh, interfering in other countries, whether it was for to form new governments or to deplete, deplete natural resources? For example, if I were to be raised in a country where all of its natural resources have been depleted, I would want to seek a different life, a better life. And normally I would seek the country in which all of those natural resources have been, if you know what I mean, if you know my question. So that's, that's a really great question. It's an essential question, and, and that is, have American policies created the immigration that has proved to be so controversial? And I, I, I think that in many ways, it's true. It, it, and, and so, especially if you look at the relationship between the United States and Latin America, this has been a relationship of extreme economic dominance for a good century and a half, and that economic dominance has often deprived people who live in Mexico and Guatemala and and uh, Colombia and, and South American countries is often provide, de deprive them of economic opportunities and so they come to the United States because they've been deprived of economic opportunities. But this situation is actually more extreme in Europe and especially France and Britain because their formal colonial empires, I mean the United States never had, has had a kind of economic empire but it's never had a really formal colonial empire, with a couple of exceptions, Puerto Rico and Philippines and so on. But, but if you look at the British and the French empires in the first part of the 20th century, these are huge empires. And so the relationship of hierarchy and exploitation has produced a massive wave of immigration away from the former colonial empire precisely because the imperial policies had made things so difficult for the people who lived there. And so if, if you look at who who migrates to France and who migrates to, to Britain, it is almost entirely people who come from their former empires. And so I think that the situation that you talk about, it's certainly relevant to the United States. It's even more relevant to Britain and France. And the Netherlands to a certain extent too. Thank you so much, Ed. Great. <laughs>